or anything else, it starts now. So this was a talk I gave multiple times, and I was asked to do a whole lecture on durable functions uh, following the first session that was on serverless itself. So this session is normally only 45 minutes. And what that means is that we're gonna have a special format in which at some point we're, the slides are not gonna be enough. We're gonna to have to go into the docs and we will walk through the docs and we will show you uh, what I mean and the few of the important, important things that uh, need to be understood before we move forward. So let's start. First, hi, my name is Maxime Rouillet. Uh, I am not French from France. I am a French Canadian, uh, lover of maple syrup and bacon, uh, like every Canadian. Uh, and if you have any questions at any time, this is more of a kind of a lecture kind of st stuff. So I, I'm, I'm expecting questions. So if you have questions in the middle, please do ask them at the moment uh, because I'm just gonna allow me to elaborate on those uh, specifics. All right, so the talk was originally called Here Hold My State, uh, Dribble Functions for Serverless Workflow. All right, let's make sure I get the actual focus here. All right, so. Uh, let's do a quick one slide summary of what Azure Function is. Uh, Azure Functions basically takes in a whole bunch of events, things like timers, HTTP, or messaging, or things that are happening on uh, on Azure or any other kind of services, which triggers some code that can be ran into like in C Sharp, F Sharp, Node, Java, or a lot of other languages right now. And it creates an output. So either you're storing it, maybe you're sending an SMS, or maybe you're just responding to the HTTP request, or maybe you're sending an email. There's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen with functions, but mostly those are single piece of code that respond to an event and triggers an output, which is great, which is amazing. This is the kind of thing we want because that allows us with this kind of framing, it allows us to scale to almost infinity because, um, the events are small enough that you don't have to have specific server. We're not talking about having a whole application here. We're talking about how do you code a single event? And th that unit of logic is small enough for us to just be able to work with that. And those are, by the way, already out of date. Like I already said, if you click on this link, we're going to be able to open up the window, which turns out to be here. Uh, we're going to go through this website instead because this slide was out of date. It's always out of date, by the way. Um, we're going to be running either with two or three, uh, the tree version. And the good news is they're all GA. What does GA mean? It means generally available, which means fully supported, approved for production use. Uh, if you open up a bug, it's, it's going to get answered. And if you have issues, uh, we're going to help you out with that. No problem. If you're in preview, uh, it might depend. So as you can see here in 1.x, we don't have anything in preview. Everything has been GA, but it's running like on. Uh, the, grand, the grandfather of Node, which is 6, and it's running on older version of .NET Framework, which is 4.7 right now. And yeah, you don't want to run that 1.x. You want to run 2.x or 3.x, and I would recommend 3.x as much as possible. And that's it for the super languages. So there's a whole bunch of different stuff, and of course we're working with experimental languages, but um, those have either become GA'd or uh, are been removed from the experimental. There's not much experimental left. All right, function triggers and binding. We've seen that in the previous talk. So basically everything that is in, on the input side becomes a trigger or in, an input. And what is on the output side is things that you can natively just return out of the function to make sure that you get those kind of things running. So what you don't see in here though is our durable functions because they're not part of the initial discussion we have with most clients or with most customers. It's because uh, it's more complicated than, than it looks and it's not really easily talkable in a single slide like this. All right, so Dribble function is out. Let's, uh, sorry, Azure function is out. Now let's just talk about Dribble functions because that is the interesting part. That is the main focus of this talk and we're, we're, we're dropping the, the uh, you know, the markety level 100 content. We're taking a few of the level 200 content and we're mostly going level 300 to 400 right now. That means intermediate to advanced, we're digging deep and we're going to be having fun with that. At least I hope you are. You all are. Okay. So there's a few key concepts that you need to understand before you move towards durable functions. First, the types of functions. There are two types of functions that are available 
when you're building dribble functions. The first one is an activity function. An activity function will actually do real work. You will call an API, you will work on the IO, you will process data, you will do something. And the orchestrator function is basically going to be the conductor. It's going to be making sure that all those activities work together. They're going to be synchronized. It's going to be like, oh, I want to call A before B before C. So I'm going to be calling like CBA and I'm going to be sending those events. Like they're taking like all those different functions, those activity, different activities, and they're making sure that they're called uh, at the right time at the right moment. Then there are the bindings. The bindings are, are um, the things that you're, allows you to basically sync the uh, the different data to your to your stuff. Uh, we're gonna sync that later in a few seconds. Uh, and event sourcing. It, and event sourcing for me is that's gonna be the, the interesting part because this whole concept of event sourcing in um, in durable function is the way that we preserve the state of the data. And there are multiple ways for us to preserve that state. Um, but basically the event sourcing means that we have an execution history in which we can rebuild a whole state. We're going to get into deep more details on that, but first, uh, let's take a look at, uh, some code. Like what does it look like? Now I have it in three languages. So, because right now as of, I think it's 24 hours ago, we officially support, um, durable functions for. Uh, C sharp for node and Python is the latest one that has just been added to the family. So if any fan of Python are in the room right now, woot woot, it's supported. So I'm going to show you code in three languages. So let's start with this function called say hello. It takes in a parameter called a name. This is not the real signature of an activity function, by the way. This is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to show you how to, to write it down. Not a problem. It's just basic code. We're going to go together. Okay. So first thing first, you're going to get hello and you're going to get the name and you're going to be able to bind that all together and return this string hello and whatever name it is there, this is string interpolation. So you, it's the equivalent of con uh, do a concatenation of hello and the actual string, it's just simpler format. Now we have our orchestrator function. And this one will require an iterable orchestration context object to run in C sharp, and that will create create us for uh, create for us a context. And this context would allow us to call other functions. So one of the cardinal sin in, in serverless, as we talked last time, is you don't call other functions. Like you you don't do a function that calls another function. Uh, first is a function is get renamed. You, you're you're getting into trouble, and then if you're trying to um, if you're you're stuck into uh, if you're waiting for another function, right? So let's call, see. Function one is calling function two, and it's waiting for function two to return, right? So you're gonna get function one is gonna be billed for let's say one second, then it starts its execution, then function two starts at the same time, and it takes two seconds to run. Okay, so you run two second. But then function one has to wait those two seconds. So function one runs three seconds. Then the rest runs. So the function two run it's two seconds in return. So you have a total of three seconds and two seconds. You're billed for five, right? Because first function have to wait for the other one. So you don't do those kind of things. Because if you get anything that is longer, you basically multiply and multiply. And at some point it gets crazy. Because if you have five levels of function that call themselves, they're all going to wait for each other. And at some point you're getting you're getting billed for waiting and you don't want that like in serverless the whole point is you don't wait you just you're you're sending stuff you're sending an event and you're returning the result as fast as possible and if you start doing those calls to other functions you have an issue so how can we call an activity like that we're going to get into the details of that in a few seconds but let's just say that we wrap this call here to call another function under call activity async. And we're gonna see, say here, say hello, Seattle, say hello, Amsterdam, and we're gonna get that result after. But as you can see here, we're also awaiting those functions. So it means that we're gonna wait until the execution is done before returning. And we don't have the same problem I talked to you about because I'll show you the whole execution workflow on this. It's pretty amazing. 
So here's how it looks uh, using uh, using Node. So same kind of thing. You have an async function. You have a return hello binding. The whole thing is there. And the orchestrator function kind of looked the same. We're not using async anymore. We're using a yield. But um, you're seeing here the same kind of function, like say hello, Amsterdam. Uh, the whole thing is there. Uh, that works as well. That is what it looks like in Python. Same thing, a string interpolation st uh, with a name parameter into uh, in, in there. Activity function is basically doing the same thing. We're yielding for a context call activity. We're filling up a table of tasks and we're returning the outputs of those tasks. So there's ne nothing really weird. It's all the same kind of code. It's just the orchestrator just do call to different functions depending on what it wants to do. And we can move forward from here. All right, so what does event sourcing look like? Uh, the event sourcing is a local state of a pen-only execution that allows us to rebuild the whole thing. It, it is important because the orchestrator function will just schedule the whole work. It will not actually call those function. It will schedule those work by ways of um, using uh, storage messaging. So it's gonna, it's gonna store some, que some messages in a queue and that's the way for, for it to sk schedule some work. And then once this job has been scheduled, it will shut down. The orchestrator will restart peri periodi periodically and it will rebuild its local state every time. So it is important that this execution history stays small and it is imp imperative that um, this whole thing works great uh, because it will improve the performance and scalability. Uh, when you're running your orchestrator and your code is running like that, um, what that means is, okay, I'm trying to explain something without images. I'll get to those images, like next slide. So event sourcing allows us basically improve performance, improve scalability, because all those cues and those triggers are being scheduled for any other machines to run on. It does not need to call an actual function. It just, it leaves any other machine to just pick up the message. It also bring eventual consistency because since everything's in execution history is of the whole state, eventually the results are gonna come trickling back in and we're gonna be able to rebuild our state, know exactly where we are and basically have a result for, uh, for our orchestrator. But since it's an execution history, the added bonus here is that we have a full audit trails and of course the history of your orchestrator and its activities and everything it ran. So you know what came in, you know what came out, and you can basically reproduce the code. And if you ever found a bug in there, you can basically re just rebuild the whole thing and just retest it with the proper input and outputs. All right, uh, time for some animation because now like that is the real life uh, execution of a function. So we're gonna take the same example we saw in the code earlier. We're just gonna remove one of those say hello. We're just gonna keep Amsterdam. Can be any city you want, doesn't matter. Um, and we're gonna have a standard function, start an orchestrator. And I'm gonna show you how to create an orchestrator and create all those kind of code. Not a problem. So a function will start our orchestrator. So when this orchestrator is gonna get called, it's gonna start running. So what you see on the right is kind of our execution history. Not exactly, it's not exactly the same, but it's gonna be the kind of event you're gonna see uh, popping up on the screen and it will allow us to track those kind of things. But those are events that are happening and we know like how they, how they happen and when they happen. So you're gonna get orchestrator started. So that's the very first one and then execution started. That means that we actually started the whole code and we're not at the end yet. And then we reach that second line where we're waiting for this call activity async. So what do we do? The first thing we're gonna do is look at the execution history. And we're gonna be asking, did we ever run that function within like our context right now? Did we ever run the function say hello with the parameter Amsterdam? And by questioning the execution history, the answer is gonna be no, we have not run that before. So what's gonna happen next is get, we're gonna schedule a task to say, I want you to run this activity function called say hello, and I want you to pass in the parameter Amsterdam. 
simple enough, right? But then the orchestrator going to have to wait. But instead of waiting, it's actually just going to shut down because it doesn't know how long the activity is going to take. In our case, it's going to take a few milliseconds, but it may take a few seconds or longer. We're going to get to those scenarios in a few seconds, but it can take like days before we have any results. So what are we going to do? Keep on running until like our credits runs out? The answer to that is no. We're just going to shut down and we're going to wait. But since the activity function is just unqueuing a message and returning, um, and it's just returning a, a string, what's going to happen at some point is that an Azure function is actually going to pick up that message and it's going to run the code. In our case, it's just string interpolation, LO name, and it's going to say LO Amsterdam and return. So that function now has added the that the task is completed to the execution history, that it received the input Amsterdam, and it re resulted in LO Amsterdam as the output. So once that activity is done, it's technically over for, for that activity. We don't need to run it again. So at some point, we don't know when exactly, but it will restart. The, act the orchestrator function from having that event just unqueued will eventually restart. And it's going to go through the code again, the same thing, line one, line two. And it, when it's going to get to the second line, it's going to do exactly the same thing it did at first. Look at ex execution history and basically ask that we ever ran that function again. Say hello, Amsterdam, I don't know. And the execution history this time is going to say yes. So we had this function called say hello. Like it's going to look in the execution history and we have it here. Like this function was called and the result was hello Amsterdam. So the thing is that we don't even need now to schedule anything else because we have our result. And that result is going to be added to the outputs. So as soon as the output is done, it's going to return output uh, hello Amsterdam. The orchestrator had started, but now it, the execution has completed with those results. So the actual orchestrator now will have Rubble function is backed by a few different technologies, um, but mostly it's it's storage. It's something that is on Azure that you can find pretty much anywhere. Uh, the execution history, by the way, is just a table. It's a NoSQL kind of kind of table that only have a few a uh, few type of values, and that execution history is going to be uh, pretty short, uh, but it's backed by a table. When you trigger activity functions, that's based with the only um, the storage triggers, the, trig the storage queues. So when you're you're putting stuff in there, it triggers events. And that activity function, since its early stages, has always been able to respond to those to those queues to those message in the queues. So it's only reusing the kind of stuff that is already available since the beginning. It's kind of like a smarter way to do that. Now, I, I would love for you to think about how would you implement this in your own code? Like no frameworks, no nothing. You just have you just have Azure Drupal function. You just have Azure functions. You have access to the same storage elements. How would you implement it for each function that you want to call like that? You're going to need to make sure that you do error handling. You're going to need to make sure that you actually handle the queues. And not just the main queues, you're going to have to handle the dead queues. Like the, if an, 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 an element is triggered and it cannot be on, on queued, you have to handle that as well. Like, so all those elements, all those plumbing that you would do to handle like those kind of functions that you want to call this asynchronously in, in this process, we've already done for you. You don't need to code it. Like this plumbing is done. And we support you and we're, we're going to fix the, any problem you find or you may find. So all this is supported and we're, we've already done the plumbing for you. So basically this is the kind of cool stuff. Uh, that's why frameworks are created. 
So with all of this stuff now in our mind, there is something very uh, interesting that, that happens is that we can start having some patterns. And I'm going to I'm going to be showing you version one of those patterns. And actually, I think that it's this one is actually better to just show you um, show you the code. So the first thing I'm going to drop you in in the chat is I'm going to drop you this um, this URL. If you want to walk with me through those steps, we're going to go together. But we're going to see here there's a lot of different stuff that are um, that are supported in terms of languages. But that's not what I want to see. I want to look at the application patterns. So we're going to walk through all of those application patterns. There was a few of them that uh, I didn't know before, but we're, we're going to get we're going to get there. Uh, so pattern one, the function chaining. Let me just zoom in a little bit. 125 is good. So the first thing we have here is function chaining. That means taking the result of one, saving it, and then having the function two take from one state. So you're you're running a function, it returns something, and you're taking that something and passing it into this next function. So here we have an example, and we still have those three languages, same, same thing. As you can see here, function one will return x and x is, is going to be used for function two and z is going to be used uh y is going to be used for function three and so on until we're done but one of the thing you see here are the await or the yield we're chaining those we want to make sure that we're sending those um one at a time that we're that we're waiting for each of them to run because we need uh, we need uh, F1 to run if we ever want to run F2. And we need F1 and F2 before we can ever run F3. That happens all the time. Those are like steps that you want to run. Right? So this is called function chaining. We're just we're just chaining them. And that's super cool. That is one of my favorite patterns. The fan out, fan in. And... Again, it is available in all three languages, but what happens here is that function one is going to return you something, and from that something, you're going to you're going to fan out to multiple functions. You're going to queue multiple functions to be executed, and from all of those, they're all going to return something. You're going to take all of their results, and you're going to send them to one other function. So let's do this. Let's take a look at what we have here. I can show you in C-sharp, JavaScript, or in Python. I'm a big fan of C-sharp. Um, so what we have here is we have a call activity async that will return a, will return an, an array. Like we're returning an array of objects, but it can be any serializable type. So whatever you want. Object is just for demo purposes. So this object here is going to be an array of all the different elements that are returning from this. It could be triggered from a database. It could be triggered from an API on an other services or whatever. And then if you're looking at a for loop here, we're going to go through each of those elements, but we're going to be calling call activity async on F2 with that specific element. But I want you to notice here, there's no await keyword. Same thing in JavaScript. We're yielding for F1, but we're not yielding for this one, right? That means that we're not waiting for the result. So we're gonna go through that loop like real fast. It does not matter if your loop has one item, 10 items, 100 items, or a million items. It really does not matter. Because all of those are gonna be uh, messages we're gonna be putting on a queue to be executed later on. All those activities that we're, um, we're scheduling, that's, that's it, that's how we're doing it, but without waiting for the result. We're actually going to be waiting for the result right here. That's where the fun begins. Because all of those activities now, like if you only had one, you're probably not going to scale up. You're probably going to stay at one machine, even if it's on your local machine. One machine is going to be plenty enough. But what if you have a million items? Or let's just take a smaller number, 100,000 items. It could be just 10,000. It doesn't really matter. Like At that point, you have enough messages in the queue, enough what we call pressure, that if you're on Azure, we're actually going to start adding machines and they're going to start unpiling those activities. 
and they're going to start running them, even if it's just Hello World. And they're all going to return a result at some point. But it's only when you reach that line of code that we're actually going to verify that all those functions ran properly and going to, we're going to actually wait. And if the orchestrator gets to that line and not all of those function as completed, even if it takes hours, the orchestrator is just going to shut down. It's going to wait again and return later to just say like, okay, are, are you done? Nope. All right, let's go back. And it's going to shut down again and wait again. It's going to keep on doing that until at some point all of those tasks get finished running and we're going to get a result. And from all of those tasks, once they're all completed, we can run some, some basic code. But one of the things I like to do is maybe build an array of all the elements that it returns. So maybe they're all saying hello in a random city. And then the activity is saying here, we're, we want to actually save those results because we've just spent like, like seconds of compute on multiple servers just to run those kind of thing. And we want to make sure that we're saving them. So here F3 is going to take those results and just save them somewhere, database, table storage, or wherever you want, maybe send an email. Uh, let's just hope you're not sending a million emails. Um, but otherwise, that's what it does. Then we're into the async HTTP APIs. Those are the kind of scenarios where you want to run something, you want to start an orchestrator, and you kind of want to monitor it. Like you want to make sure that this thing is like, is this still running? Is it done yet? So things like you're scheduling something to work and you have a client, like in a single page application, and you want to, you just want to make sure that like when you get the result, you can actually start, uh, you, you can actually like report on the status. You want to make sure that you can actually output the result to your client. So that can be actual work. So let me show you how it's done. Uh, lower. Okay, this one does not have an example. Let me see if I can get you the, the actual slide for this one. So that was function chaining, the fan out, same code. Um, that's not the one. Okay. So, okay. So this one, I have a better example. Let me just uh, read it. Emotion analyzer. I'm going to show you the app. So what I have right here, for example, let me just zoom in. So this is not actually from um, from an from an orchestrator point of view. This is coming from for me at least an HTTP trigger. The basic function we're not in Dribble function anymore. We're just using an HTTP trigger, but we're actually using a Dribble client to start our our, our, our orchestrator, right? So it's going to be called like at line forty three right here. <coughs> My apologies. So at line forty three, we're going to actually start our a Dribble function, but we also want to, from the starter, we want to make sure that we create a, a check status response. You can do this pattern. And that will monitor this specific instance of your durable functions. And it will give you some kind of result that will allow you to basically see like, okay, is it working or not? And we're going to be creating something along those lines uh, in, in a demo very soon. Another pattern is a monitor. So when you want to monitor a, the status of a job, you don't really know. You, you could use a timer trigger for Azure uh, for an Azure function, but the problem with Azure uh, function is that at some point that timer is fixed and is you cannot just turn it off. This thing is just going to run forever, and it's still going to count as an execution. So what you kind of want to do here is you want to create a timer until either you get an expiry time or that you actually can return the proper result, like send an alert, and then you want to break out of that of that loop. So that allow you to basically say, all right, we're going to wait for like five seconds, and I want to check that status again. And then you have, okay, so that was not done. So let's wait for 10 seconds now. Maybe now we're going to wait for 20. 
and then 40. So you're doing kind of this like sliding expiration thing. You can't do that with a timer trigger on Azure function. You can do that with Drobal. So those are like more advanced scenarios that allows you to run those kind of things. Same thing for JavaScript and Python, of course. So like all the examples are here. Pattern number five, human interaction. So this one is super, uh, super cool. If you have any kind of approval process or you need a human to basically say yes, yay or nay, or um, maybe have a, a device send you a confirmation that yeah, it, it, it notice an event, a specific event and now we can resume. Um, so the sample we have here is an, is an approval workflow. So let's walk through the code together. So we're gonna start by requesting an approval. So this whole process is gonna start and what it's gonna, we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna wait for 72 hours. So the due time here is gonna be like in, two, in three days from now. 24, 48, yeah, three days from now. So we're gonna create a timeout, a durable ti a, a timer that's gonna create our timeout. But then we also have this function called wait for an external event. Any durable function can send that event or even like a standard function can start that event. So what we're gonna do is that as soon as we get receive that event, it's gonna complete that specific function. And of course, we're not awaiting them. We're just starting them and we're gonna actually wait for them. And this is gonna be the same, same thing we saw with a fan out, fat in, but this time we're just waiting for two. When any of them completes, so it could be the approval event if a human being actually click on the link, or it can be the timeout if we waited three days and there's nothing else. If it was the approval event and a human being clicked on it, we're gonna run this code. But if it was a timeout, we want to escalate. So you have different processes depending on the timeout. Those are way more advanced scenarios that you can't really do without like way more code uh, uh, in Azure Function or without hosting a whole full-fledged application as well. Um, and here's, by the way, how do you raise an event with a Dribbble client, both in JavaScript or Python or any other kind of code. So we're not gonna go into the, the, la the last pattern because this one is called Dribbble Entities and it would deserve a talk on its own. Uh, but basically think about orchestrator that has their own state, but what if you could store objects instead of, um, instead of um, of an orchestrator itself, what if an object had, had its own like execution history? So that's what the kind of thing that you have. So you can have a counter and that, like increment your values out of this and you would be able to call them and improve those, like increase those, those, uh, those values on those objects. But we're not gonna talk about those because those is like, once you understand durable functions, let's move on to entities, but uh, so far, uh, that's what we're we're running with. Let me see if I can get back to my slides. Um, actually, let's go back to our function trigger, orchestrator code. Um, one thing. I want to talk about sub-orchestration. So we saw how we could call an activity async from an, or an orchestrator piece of code. So at any point you can call an activity and it's gonna start, run the activity, only run it once and return you the result. And that's fine, but what if your orchestrator could call another orchestrator? And it would have its own lifestyle, its own lifetime, and its own states, and its own like pipeline. But what if you could? You would get sub orchestrator, and there's no limit to the amount of sub orchestrator you can have. You could have teams working on separate orchestrator, and have different result. So, here we're doing the same fan out, fan in pattern, but now instead of calling it activity, we're calling orchestrators. So we're fanning out to orchestrators. So maybe like that function, device provisioning orchestration, has a way more complex scenario than just a single function call. Maybe it's a bunch of functions that you have to call together. And that orchestrator, the same orchestrator we had above, doesn't need to know that it's running from an orchestrator. It just does what it has to do. 
So that is the last thing. Like this is the equivalent of, of the meme. Like so, uh, yo dog, I heard you love orchestrators, so I put orchestrators in your orchestrators. Uh, yeah, it's totally that. Like it's memeish as hell, but it's extremely powerful. So let's drop sub orchestration for now. It's a little bit uh, too complex. Um, and let's go back to the slides for um, for the things to know. Uh, let me see how many, how many people I have in, in I have right now. We have nine people, so not much of you have left. I'm happy. Um, I hope nobody has nosebleeds yet. We're going to be creating a few of that code. It sounds way more complex, but we're getting into the depth of the monster, into the depth of the monster. So the things to know, there's a whole bunch of things that you need to know, but there's a few of them. So this slide, by the way, is still going to be out of date because things are changing so fast. So now uh, I would need to update that because preview Python is false. I think they just went to GA like now. So, uh, or at least yesterday. So it took about a month for them to get, to get from preview to GA. If you know of any other languages that should have this kind of stuff, let me know. Uh, I will report that back to the team. Uh, but it's generally available now in C Sharp, in Node, and in Python as well. Okay, so important details and limitation that I found out the hard way. Orchestrator code are replayed on every write rotation to restore the local state. Okay, so that's like obvious. I already said that. Um, the activity calls are not replayed. Uh, the outputs are remembered, right? Um, so there's an important details on this because orchestrator code kind of need to be uh, deterministic. It's a big word, uh, but deterministic just means that it will always return the same result. And for something to be deterministic, all of its component need to be deterministic. Uh, so for us, that means don't write logic, which depends on random numbers in an orchestrator. So if you're going to be using like random numbers, create those into an activity. Because at that point, once the activity return a value, it will always return the same value of, of that random number. Don't get the current date from your standard date time object. We have function on the context now that allows you to basically say, get me the current date, uh, like the current time of right now. That will persist as the execution time of this dribble function. And we will always return you the same value. It's kind of a, a workaround for, for if you want to have the current date it was run on. Um, never do IO. And IO is not just like the local disk. Like never send things over the wire. Like never do HTTP calls. Don't, do, uh, don't send emails. Because if you send an email in, a, in an orchestrator piece of code, it will send an email every time it rehydrates. And if you send a million messages and it rehydrates 50 times, you're going to get 50 email. And it's going to be fun. But if you're calling a external APIs, that external API is actually going to be called those same 50 times. So it's going to be a little bit crazy. Um, and the number three is don't write infinite loop. Uh, the write infinite loop is because of the event sourcing part of the story. You remember like when we start an orchestrator, this whole thing is like saved into an, ex an execution history. So every element is gonna be cataloged as like, here's what happened during that execution. But the problem is if you write an infinite loop, it's never gonna end. You may end up with millions of rows in your execution history. So what happens then? Well, your function is gonna take longer and longer and longer to reboot. But you do sometimes need to write an infinite loop. So what you have to do is you, on, on the same context objects, you can basically do the same thing, create as new, like continue as new. I think that's the name of the function that is called, the, the, of the method that is called on that object. And that will allow you basically to restart the same orchestrator with the same ID, the same thing, but we're gonna consider this as a new history. So now you don't have to do like a super long history, Every time you're going to restart, every time that loop is going to restart, it's going to be a shorter history that is going to be more manageable. So like I said, like all those uh, first three elements have their own workarounds, and we are, we're aware of those. If you see more, uh, more problems, let us know. But I think that covers pretty much all the scenarios that we have. 
Another thing. So like I said, Drupal function is an extension. It runs in user space. Um, I actually did not say that. I said it uses storage. Uh, but Drupal function is an extension of the, the Azure function. Azure function, the way it supports all of those triggers, all those events, like the, the basic Azure functions, is through extensions. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're not re redeploying everything every time you want to add a little support for a little thing. Um, so when we want to add support for Twilio, we wanted to add support for um, emails or Microsoft Graph or those kind of things, um, we just wrote more extensions to Azure Functions to enable uh, the the triggers and the inputs and the outputs. All those are basically bound into extensions. So Dribble Functions is just that. It's an extension. And it will use Azure Storage, all the queues, the table, and the blob. The queues is going to be used for our execution history. The tables uh, is going to be used for our event sourcing with all the input, the output, the result, like the logs and everything that happens with those. And blob is basically anything that cannot fit in those previous two will be stored in a blob. And the queue or the table will link to that specific blob. That's it. Um, and here's one thing that I learned is that exception and errors are a valid output of a function. So if you say hello world, but if you instead you throw an exception, this whole stack trace is going to show up. Uh, it is a valid output, by the way, which is uh, it's going to take me to, oh, I, I, I effed it up, like real bad. Uh, I broke serverless, which is fun, by the way. You, you want to put that on your resume, like I broke serverless. That was amazing. Um, so that was my orchestrator code way back in the day. So... If we're looking at this real quickly, we're going to see, let me just put in the mouse here. Uh, we're going to see that we're get all links. All right, we're retrieving a link. So I'm retrieving a list. And from that list, um, I'm going through a loop and I'm queuing up task. I'm not doing an await. So I'm basically doing a fan out, fan in. And I wait for all of them. So that code looks, that code looks nice. Like it's not a big problem. Like nothing bad is here. Um, yeah, so get all links return about a million rows, a million element, and we're queuing all of them. And I was expecting some links to just be dead. So for me, it was from the, all the samples we have on, on Microsoft Azure. And I retrieved all those links and I was starting to do like some HTTP requests on them. I wanted to make sure like, if I get a 404 or a 500, like I would actually detect those and then would just handle it properly. But it happens to be that about one to 2% of all those links, uh, the DNS just stopped responding. Like no more domain behind that name and like finger were just broken. So I was not capturing that specific exception. And one or 2%, it's not high, like it's not that much. But for a million links, uh, we're talking about 10,000. And every time it was rehydrating, it basically retrieved all those, um, all of those um, exceptions and rehydrated them every time the orchestrator was starting again because it has to look through the execution history. And when you're trying to restore 10,000 exception messages that are just like big C-sharp stack trace, and it's not just like DNS not found, it's like where it happened in the code at what line number and like the whole details. It kind of happened to be that, like, it, that's not quite like that. And that was the uh, monitoring of the application monitoring I had way back at the time. And like you see here in the coming request, like we're handling good numbers, like multiple per seconds, like things are going great. And you're seeing the amount of dependencies, like the dependency here is our storage. It's things that are happening on um, in our storage. So we're, we're saving all those results. It's amazing. But you see here the failure rate, like there's not that many exceptions that we're happening every second but it still had to deserialize all of those. And those are the dependency call failure rate. So every time it reached storage, it tried to retrieve too much data and I was hitting quotas left and right. So things were starting to fail. And so that's just a lesson that 
make sure, and now it is pretty much everywhere in the documentation, but make sure that you have exception handling on activity functions themselves um, so that you're handling those types of errors so it does not bubble all the way back to your orchestrator. <clears throat> So let's do some code. I'm going to leave you those two links here, by the way, if you're interested. So let me just do um, data mass slash dribble function simple. And let me give you the one for um, dribble functions node simple. <clears throat> so we're going to walk through those, those those line of code, but I want to show you also how to create um, uh, to create those same functions. But if you want to know what this code does, is super simple. <coughs> it retrieved um, it will retrieve the count of open issues per repository for a determined GitHub organization and save them to an Azure table. This is the same uh, same thing we're doing uh, in terms of fan out fan in. Um, I will leave you the uh, the end slide because that's going to be my my last slide. After that, we're going into 100% code. Uh, we're we're going through stuff together. So let me just. Um, so my Twitter handle is uh, Twitter. Is this? So if you want to follow me, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm trying to get on top of that, but there's too many things on LinkedIn. Um, my email. I'm typing it into the chat so you don't have to type it yourself. And of course, if you just want to know my uh, profile and where I where I am on all social media, that last link here will cover it all. All right. So now that the slides are out of the way, uh, let's do some actual code, right? So sub orchestrator, durable entities, super languages, don't care. We can cl close all this. Um, so just to uh, bring you back, if you're starting from the Drupal functions documentation here you can the base the very cool stuff that are not code based are found in in, in, in concepts so everything that we talked about the function types click on this and you're going to get the orchestrator the activities and that is durable entities that so you don't want to look at this one specifically but then there are the client functions and so you're going to be able to look at all this. You want to look at the orchestration themselves. You can talk about all those. Like, what are the different problems? The uh, the orchestration history. How does it work? What is the schema of the table? What does it look like? Right. You can see this here, and we could walk through the schema together and basically rerun the whole thing. Um, it goes through a few of those little uh, the different element, um, but you can dive in depth here. The uh, limits and details for orchestrator that we talked about, like being deterministic, date and time, the random numbers, those kind of things, they're all available right here. Everything is in concept. So you should spend some time here. And if you are um, really uh, want to learn more and you want to go into like level 400, like even more complex than we have, uh, performance and scale in durable functions will allow you to basically customize the whole thing and allow you to get into way more complex scenarios. But uh, we're not covering that today because this is just, uh, this is crazy. So let's go some code. So the first thing we're going to do, uh, first I want to know uh, C sharp or node. People have to answer that C sharp or node. I have two node, three node. All right, let's do node. We're a sucker for punishment, so we love that. All right, so the first thing you're gonna see here, VS Code, um, I wanna do one thing. I'm gonna do a control um, control um, tilled on my, on my keyboard. It will open up the terminal. And I wanna do one thing. I wanna type func. And func is something that when you install uh, the Azure function extension, or you just want to install Azure function locally on your machine that is going to be installed uh, either when you're running the installer or when you're running the extension. So func here is basically the, the whole runtime of this thing. Function runtime can basically, by the way, be ran on your local machine 
but it can also run on Azure. It can also run on Kubernetes. So Funk, it's right here. And like I said, by the way, earlier, um, in the, lat in the latest call, uh, Azure Function is 100% almost uh, open source. The only thing that is not open source is our scalable controller for Azure. And like, how do we scale functions on our servers? Like, that's the only thing that is ours. Otherwise, how do you scale that on Kubernetes? This is open source. How do you run this thing locally? It's open source. Uh, like, everything is open source. So you can see here that like, if, if you ever have to debug something and we're asking you what, what version are you running, that's what we want to know, like this part here. Like, what version of the core tools are you running? What version of the runtime are you running? So that, that's pretty much it. If you're in VS Code, you want to go into the extension. And I want you to install Azure Functions. That is important. That is the that is the part. Let me just close the terminal for now. That is the part that will enable this icon here if you don't already have it and the function section in here. If you want to be able to deploy an Azure function onto the cloud, you need a different extension. You need the extension that is called, um, let me look for Azure. You're gonna need the Azure uh, account. So you're, if you want to enable the authentication, be able to deploy, you're, you're gonna need that. And they build on top of each other. So let's go back to functions. So of course, I have too many of them, but Azure function is the one I want. So everything that you're going to see in the UI can all be done through either the CLI or it can be done with a different command. As you can see here, by the way, oh, core tools. You know what? Living dangerously. Let's update that. I w that was not planned, by the way. But yes, we're distributing our core tools with NPM. So we're going to let that run for a few seconds because... We're living on the edge here, but uh, basically what we're, we want to do is create a new project. And we're going to do a demo. So let's create a new demo, uh, lecture at home. That's where we're going to be. From there, still from within VS Code, you're going to be able to pick your language. So for us, it's going to be JavaScript. And it's loading, but now it will allow us to basically say, uh, what template do you want to run on? And for us, we want a Dribbble function HTTP starter. We're going to need something to start our Dribbble function. So let's do uh, that HTTP function uh, starter for now. And we're going to be calling it, uh, I don't know, cool name, um, start orchestrator. And we're going to be using anonymous and we're going to use the current window hoping it does not crash the update of the of the whole thing so it looks a lot like the drill like the standard functions that you're going to see before so just as before we're going to ignore proxies package.json this time uh has nothing special that's cool uh the local settings here there's nothing in here the so host JSON, same thing, same kind of bundles. So there's nothing really special here. The start orchestrator function, what we're going to see is if you go into the function.json, we're going to get our, our orchestrator in here. And it's going to be a template for the function name that we want to run on. And it allows us to do get and post and also have it's going to automatically inject or an orchestration client. This is the same thing we saw in C-sharp, where you're allowed to do start new, right? So that's what we want to do. And it will handle the return. So when if you return something, it will basically say, this is going to be an HTTP return. We, we're going to return an HTTP response, and that's what we want to do. All right. So here's what the code looks like. It looks an awful lot like something we saw earlier. Um, I always forget like what this thing is anyway. Um, but we're going to have our client. So DF is our pattern here. So we're going to need drillable functions, right? So if we're running um, this code, uh, what we're going to, the problem we're going to have is that this thing is not, might not be installed. So what we're going to do, we can do an NPM install drillable function save. Let's keep that into the package at JSON. Of 
course, already have it installed, and this package is going to update in a few seconds. There you go. So now we see here it resolved properly into the right no known modules, and we're getting our client. The client is going to be able to start a new orchestrator with the name that is going to be passed in parameter, and it's going to send in the body as a parameter. We're not going to be sending anything else. All right, so we have our HTTP client. So let's do another one. Um, let me just move that thing here. All right. Um, so I'm going to do something different here because the thing is, I could I could go back into the uh, into the Azure um, to the Azure part here and say like new function and run the script through here, right? But let me show you a different way to do it because like the UI is fun, but yeah, might be long. So if you type control shift B, uh, sorry, control shift P uh, or the equivalent, what you can have, let's cancel that. We can type Azure functions and all the different functions or command that we, we, we export are available right here. You want to update your local settings, you can do so. You can stop and start functions. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. But one of the things we want to do is we want to just create a function. So those are commands I'm using all the time. New project, deploy, edit settings. Uh, so let's do create function. And you didn't have to go through the UI. So the first thing we need to do is create an orchestrator. So let's do that. And we're going to call this uh, Hello world. All right. So this is the same type of code we had. So it still requires durable functions DF to start. And this DF is going to be in our context. It's going to be mapped onto our context. And we're going to be able to call our activities. And they're basically called hello. We're going to be more polite. Say hello. I don't know if it's polite. And all three cities. It's the same. Um, it's the same function. You're going to be like chaining one after the other. And now we need our actual function. So again, same shortcut, create function. But this time we want to have a durable uh, activity. So we have those are your trifecta of stuff that you want to do. So function activity, uh, we're going to call this one again. Say hello. And it's the same thing we saw earlier. Like it's the same bindings, the same names that are being bound together. And it's just going to return hello with the um, the name that is passed in. So all this is good. Let's just close everything. And let's look at the menu on the left. We're going to have our hello world, which is going to be our orchestrator. We're going to have a function, which is going to be a client function. So any kind of any kind of a Azure function will work. If you can see here, there's nothing special really about that function in terms of in or out parameters, except maybe the orchestration client, which is a special type that we bound, bound in. But otherwise, the trigger is an HTTP trigger. So in this case here, we have an HTTP trigger, but there's nothing preventing you from having a timer or unpiling a message from a service bus or sky's the limit pick a trigger and you can have the same kind of code trigger an orchestrator there's no limit so we already looked at that piece of code we already look at that piece of code the same function here the only difference here is the type is an activity trigger and it's bound to the name and the yellow world here we have an orchestration trigger and this one is is bounded to the context that's it those are our, our bindings now we're ready to run that. So let's just do, um, before I do F5, <coughs> sorry, um, there's multiple ways to start debugging. You can do run and start debugging, or you can go into here, the little play button and attach a function. Like, why do we see that? We see that because we have a VS code folder with um, attach node function for the launch with all the settings that we're going to be using, with the tasks that are available that needs to run for this. Uh, if somebody opens up this project uh, with VS Code and does not have the extension, we're actually going to be uh, 
recommending this. So if you're looking for the extension in the, in, in the tool, we're going to be recommending that you install this because it's going to be easier for all of us. If somebody created this folder and does not have that folder here or did not com commit it to uh, the repository, what you can do, control shift P again, Azure functions, and you can do initialize project for use with VS code. And that folder is going to be created for you. You don't have to do anything else. All right, so let's actually debug this. Start debugging. Uh, so did I, did it fail? So that's kind of this kind of scenario that you're you're gonna know what the, the oh man it broke. Okay, so we're gonna be debugging something together apparently. All right, let's just install the latest version and let's do that together. So I'm gonna be using. Um, this. Let's see if it works. Uh, file exist. Remove the file existing again or with force or write. Uh, you know let's just uninstall the core tool. Let's just uninstall everything and try to reinstall it. All right, file already exists. Mission core tools, non modules. All right, for sake of fun. I sure hope you know what you're doing. No, I don't. Normally, that th those would be the kind of moment that people would laugh, but um, normally it's just a little bit sad. So this is where the, the, the things are downloaded. So while this is being run, uh, um, we're going to wait for this run. So there's a little bit of download happening here. Um, let me show, show you the, um, the GitHub repository for this thing. Your functions, uh, get github.com slash, slash Azure slash Azure functions. So just, just, just like I said in the previous talk, the whole, the whole thing is open. So, so things from the documentation, the runtime, the core tools, the development tools that are Visual, Visual Studio and VS Code are open source. The portal UI, UI in the, in the portal is there. All the templates are sealed. And if you're getting to trouble, trouble functions, there's this one, there's JavaScript. Um, there's one for um, All right, so that's the extension that is used for dribble function. This one is also obviously, um, it is open source. Have language, language support. So partial is running. Java, Java under consideration. Can in install extensions like that. So that, that's one way to do it. If you want to file, file a bot or dribble, dribble function for phone, this is all here. Uh, the, uh, the whole thing is working. Um, not that much you have to do. But it's, it's all available. Where does that, that go? Not, not too bad. All right. All right. Uh, one of those samples that we were talking about earlier. Um, there's a thing I want to show and the dribble, um, dribble fins, fins, uh, scraping API for, for Node because, because we already did that. So the, the, the link, link I sent you earlier, let's walk through those together. So we're going to have an org here with an HTTP start. This is the same thing we talked about. Like, so it's an HTTP here with a starter registration client as, as in, and there ain't much that's in here. Um, and, the, and the code is just the same thing we saw. Like, like we're starting running a new orchestrator, and, and we do create check stats response, so we can keep on monitoring it. Actually, the actual orchestrator is here. So, so what does it do? So we have a function here that will retrieve all, all the repository repos for an, organization, or an organization name, and we're going to get this list of repositories, the same fan-on-fan pattern we used before. 
And for each of those, we're going to just push, push that uh, that task, get open open issues into an array. Wait, wait, wait for all of them to complete, and then we're going to, we're going to save them. So let's take a look at those code. So the get ready repositories is not that complex. Uh, get, get repositories is basically just using things, something called OctoKit Fest to queue uh, to query the, uh, the API, and by receiving um, um how does it call, call the organization name uh, and parameters that is uh, from the con the context bindings input. And it will take that organization name and, and query all, all the repos for that specific name that are public. So we don't want to do anything like private or um, if your token has access to like, like weird things, uh, we, we only want public ones. And it will, it will, it will retrieve all those, all those repos. And that's all, that's all it's going to turn, right? Just re repositories that we need to, we, we need to process. The get open issues will receive that repository, and from again from the input binding, from from, from the input is going to look at the owner, the owner will get in, going to look, look at the name, and is, and is going to get the list of issues, and we're going to be, be paging through all those issues, this activity, activity function. But here's the thing: is this this function can start doing widely the same thing. Like, what about all the issues, the issues that has not modified in the last x amount of days? Has been on touch, or nothing has been done. All the, the all the issues are older than year year old. Like you start start having very very cool scenario, cool scenario with those. And since those are going to be all married already, and and to a save with save repos, the thing I'm, thing I'm doing here is is really simple. Uh, uh, I'm using the uh, the the table fridge from Azure, and I'm saving it into a table. Like I said. So you're gonna get a list of open issues, repository name, and we're just just save those all the bad batch. That's it. Super simple. And and so you can start modding this stuff. Stuff. Every time you receive a list of elements that you want to process and, and then save the results, that that that, that is it. Every time you want to do uh, uh, collect collect queries, um, especially especially if you're gonna you need to you need to retrieve a list of items out of SQL Server or a SQL kind of um, devices you're you're running a cloud scenario um you want to do those kind of things like save initially okay sophia soon soon thanks, thanks for coming so let me see if i can get the uh this this thing is right now now it's, all, it's almost um, um so basically what I, there, there's not much left here to do we're, we're just hoping this thing is going to work otherwise uh I, I don't know what happened on my machine. Uh, it was working before. Uh, so there's multiple scenarios uh, that Azure Function basically can, can, can allow you to do, and Dribble just take those and push them like one step further away. Is that kind of the thing, by the way, that w would be helpful to you? Like, is that something interesting, or, or it's just you, you don't really need to use? All right, so let's see if, see if this thing works. Let's do F5 and we'll see if this thing works. Let's lose local emulator, so this should work. All right, this one is a little bit weird, so it's just development storage. Let me see sure I Azure storage. Later. So I, I, I'm running Windows. This thing works perfectly fine. Just, just it works. It does. All right. Let's do it again. Normally, if you're uh, running on a Mac, you would want to have the um, you wouldn't want to have the um, an Azure storage account uh, because we don't have an emulator for, for the Mac so lately. So same thing that we do do the whole process that has been defined in our VS uh, task here. We're doing an npm install to make sure everything is done. Then we're writing a func host start to start start our function. 
we're downloading a whole bunch of different bundles. If they're uh, out of date, everything should be fine. Please, I've downloaded enough stuff today. We don't need more, more downloads. Please. Oh, gosh. This is fun. All right. So the bundle has been installed. There's just different uh, workers that are available. So those are just initialization stuff. Uh, um, then we're going we're to start the orchestrator. This little, little API like that. that. So our orchestrator name is called Hello World. So uh, we're going to keep that, uh, that, that name here. And we're going to copy that. And I'm going, going to just put up the little window heel here. And we're going to call this Hello World. And press start. start. We're gonna, and we're going to see here the, this whole, whole execution history happening. So, so take a look. Executing a shipping request. So uh, we're re receiving the request that I just did when I pressed enter with this URI. And this is do this function to start orchestrator. And we can see here. Okay, start an orchestration with ID. So an ID is going to automatically be generated. And this is going to be uh, uh, and the function start orchestrator now is going to be, I'm done, I'm, I'm finished, I don't have anything else to do. So here, a low world is going to be running. And we're going to see it here, executing a low world. I would request test ID, the different methods are going to be being called. A function hello world orchestrator started. We have a whole bunch of different IDs and stuff going. Function say hello. We're starting to those messages coming here. here. So, so say hello activity, and then does it have anything in here that will allow to determine which which one it was? No, no. But we have like sequence number seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So the whole thing is going to be get, get get called for say hello. And then we can see here the orchestrator is picking back up, right? Right. The world is there. Um, um, and it's kind of like monitoring your whole thing. But but at some point. Well, well, it will execute, executed. The orchestra would have completed. Uh, yeah, it, here. Hello world completed, and we're. Done. The thing is, when when we did that, did that request, we were that. That is, that is the um. The HTTP, I think, I think HTTP uh status uh, pattern we saw here. So you see here the status uh, get status query URI. If we, if we take that. We can open it up, up, and we would we would get an output object with our LKO, LKO, LKO Seattle, and LKO London. So, so all those things are already done, and we, we could take any of the other, the other code that I wrote, any, any other functions, it would work, work just as well. So I've used that, that to do one last sam sample, one last demo. So if you're going on Reddit, I did, did, did that. I hope it works at some point. It's fulfilling. I don't know if it's fixed. I use, use that to create basically a um, pro process. But this one I'm doing is, is I'm I'm scanning Reddit, and I'm wondering if there's anything in there that are, are like, is it happy or sad? And I don't, know why, I don't know why it's failing right now, but let's look at the code. And... Look at look at the application itself. This one, this one is in step, so I'm, so I'm sorry if there's no node equivalent. But but we're running the same exact exact same code. We're running the uh, static status response. We're starting the the red the uh, red thread analyzer, which is the orchestrator. And this one is doing something really really weird, really really spe special. And it's it's doing this uh, uh, same shadow chaining thing. So it's gonna it's gonna get the emotion result. And if there was not not exist. We're gonna we're gonna keep on going. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get at the URL. If, by the way, if you're just, just taking Reddit at URL, you do dot JSON and at the end, you get a whole bunch of stuff in there. That is super interesting. That's what you're doing right here. So we're gonna get this all, this whole JSON content. Then I'm gonna parse all those comments and I'm those comments those comments and send them over to uh, analyze the emotions out of them. And, and once the emotions have been analyzed, I mean those those results. And I'm using this creatively a little bit because if I see those results, I don't, don't want to consume more Azure resources. I want to return the result automatically. And you're doing that right there. Like all the rest here below, it's just like, it, it's 
it's, it's busy code. But mag- magic here is here. Like, this is my orchestrator. This is the kind of thing you're doing. And, and of course, it's just going back, going back. This is just like like a Chrome, Chrome extension that's just, just doing a fetch interval on this, this specific API URI. And that's it. And it's watching for depending on running. And it's, as soon as like, it's it's not pending and it running, running, we're, we're, we're considered done on and w- want to make sure like this is completed. Once, once it's completed, uh, uh, it's going to go up an icon. In this case, it's, it's not working. I don't know why. Uh, but it's just it's gonna, it's gonna do that. And it's gonna, gonna do that on, on all of those. You, know, you can start building uh, um, complex scenarios, more complex flows, flows with Azure functions. Uh, I don't have anything else right now, so that's pretty much, much it. it will, I will take questions. I will stay here uh, for as much as you need. Uh, but I will answer all your questions and we can go into more of that if it's um, something you're interested in. So, so otherwise, I'm pretty much done. Let me just let me just bring back that magic slide. It's always, it's always cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Blah blah blah. Q and A. We're we're happy. At least we all here. Okay. Thank you, Maxim. Do you know whether TypeScript is supported for Durbins or whether it is planned yes. support? TypeScript is supported through uh, the transpilation process. It is not not running ty- TypeScript directly. It is transpiling the TypeScript to JavaScript, and then JavaScript can be run on the uh, will be run through the same Node.js process. Yes, but yes, it is supported. Cool, thank you. No problem. So let me see, just by the way bring bring back the um, Azure Functions supported language languages, and you, you're gonna get typed here here. It's, it's GA with its uh, number one. Sort of true transpiling to JavaScript. So, I'm curious about how many of you um, um, would need more time to play with this. It is a complicated subject when you're getting in depth. How many of you would play with this thing? We created, a, a, by the way, a whole orchestrator and the process here of thing here. We, we, we created it in about like five minutes when this thing was managed you on stuck my machine. But this whole code we created together, this whole thing here, like took minutes. It could probably go faster just doing like enter, enter, enter on everything and, and hurried up a bit. Nice, Ali. That, that's amazing. That's fun. If you need, if you need some uh, some guidance on this. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask a question quick, quick yeah, re- yeah. regarding a specific pattern that we thought of implementing was the so-called competing consumers pattern. Um, I think, think the idea is that you have a specific, specific resource or like some specific object and you want it to be uh, let's for example, for example, you have several instances of, instances of the same function. I want, want only one of the functions to like, like run on that specific object, for example. And the idea is that, for example, if we have five objects coming in, then it's, instead of having a way to wait for one function to finish like the five sequ- sequentially, then instance of function take one of, one of the objects from the queue, and then another function who is free doing thing, nothing takes the second object queue. Is, is this input like sort of pattern possible with durable functions? Um, I think it looks more something that durable entities may may do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that's different. different uh, that, that, okay, so once you know a little bit what the durable function is, it becomes even easier to understand what durable entities are. And they're basically uh, um, a way for you to save entities or objects, kind of like, like actors. It's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not really an actor model. We call it an entity model because there's there's a whole uh, there are expectation when you're talking about an actor model. But it's just, uh, the the kind of uh, same, same object that we're, we're talking about here. Um, so the general concept here is that the same object will in the object, but they're being looked as the first one. We want to 
want to, want to classify issues with like several classified classes. So for example, we have a, like a class of classified meta specific model, such as KNN, so it's a weird sort of machine machine learning, a, a bunch of other yeah, classifiers yeah. on another model. So the idea is that instead of, for example, you want to classify a specific, specific issue, we let all classifiers of a specific model run on that one specific issue. They're all going to do the same result. Otherwise, there's, there's something wrong with our machine learning model. So whose who's yeah. spare resources is that, is that only with those, those instances run on, on that issue. And if there are any other issues in the queue, then the other instances can take over and, and run on these issues in it. So like, like all running the, the exact same issue. Okay, okay. So that, by the way, a classic fan out, fan in pattern, as in you have a list of issues. And your, your activity is going to be like classify you. You, need to, you just need to call them. Uh, let me just bring back the pattern again. again. Uh, let's go back to the um, functions and, and uh, what are chargeable functions? Maybe I don't know. Uh, fan out, fan in. Here you go. Um, Yeah, so you're getting, for example, here there's the call back backup sound content and fan of fan of fame. But basically, it's retrieving a list of elements for you, it would be your list of, your list of issues. And then, and then you would function here, and for you, instead of the file, it would be classify issue. You're not updating them, you don't want to, like, for for each and every one of them, you don't do them sequentially, you want to do them in parallel. Uh, I don't know exactly how you want to run them, them, but if you run them in parallel, you're just doing a wait here, and it's gonna, it's gonna work. We're in C. Um, that, that, so by the way, it's called call activity async. You're basically guaranteeing that, that every function is gonna run specific code once. So this is this method here, and I'm gonna put in could be, could be your classifier. That's that's it. When all of those that finish running, and it, and it can take seconds. Minutes, days, weeks. Once all of those are finished running, then you want to do something with it. So, so maybe you want to update them, or, or maybe you want to start another orchestrator that will then individually update the status of each of those uh, of those issues. Well, so the, our idea of the day would be the that the aggregate of this is, is, is going to be collected by a final sort of classifier that will make the best choice. Try to, try to reach a result that would be far better than any of the, any of the classifiers individually. Yep. So, yeah, that's pretty much our idea. Yeah, so that those are totally scenarios. Just look at everything that is, that is there. Like Those are like high patterns that we identified. But like just a thing that I did with it was just like like short circuit for the result for like avoid, avoid consuming too many resources. But this is just not a done pattern. It's just something I came up with is because I wanted to save some money. And the thing is, you can, you can start building those thing with like Lego blocks. The simple rules are: an orchestrator can either call an activity or for a sub orchestrator, mm -hmm. and the code has to be uh, determined. That's it. After that, you can start putting if and for loops and like start start having weird stuff and there's no problem. If you want to set a variation on it as well, it works just as well. But it's just Lego Lego blocks at that point. You're building stuff and I think that the, that's the promise of functions in some point. It's the promise of serverless. You're fo you're focusing on the on the scaling, not on plumbing, and. Mm -hmm. That's what we allow you to do here. It's like you don't have to handle all those messages and those queues and how do you handle that? What happened if it's all like schedule your work, code, code, tell me how you would structure it in your brain, like write it down. And once it's there, it works. And let me see, let me see if I can show you a piece of code that I wrote. Uh, um, by the way, this is this code is internal, so didn't didn't, didn't show you anything. I need to take a take take. Yeah, but anybody else on that call is seeing any, anything. Um, um, but yeah, it is internal, but it's not that internal. I'm tr I'm working the, this um into um, um a public repository. Um, but basically, I'm doing something uh internally within Microsoft. I'm doing a, a project called uh, "What You and You in Docs," and mm -hmm. this 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 project is about ret retrieving all the new changes that are happening in GitHub. In our, in our docs, God knows, knows we have a whole bunch of docs, and we're having different teams, and they're like structured differently, trying to find out find out what changed because we can't even can't even keep track of that ourselves. So I have, I have a bot that will do this whole thing, right? So let me see. 
and I refactored the whole thing like recently. So what do we have here? I'm gonna have a timer that the, on the first Monday of every month, this code is gonna run. It's, it's gonna look at all the docs in .NET and, and all the docs in ASNet Core, and like like the, this is the input of my trigger. Like I'm gonna start a new async with that orchestrator. But that orchestrator is not done. Like it's, it's going to do exactly what I said. It's going to do a fan out. It's not going to fan in because there's nothing to fan in on. Mm -hmm. But it's going to fan out on all those, all those, or, those orchestrator, and it's going to, it's going to start another orchestrator. So we're going to just, I'm just using that to basically say all, all of those are orchestrator, and I'm, and I'm using an orchestrator to move more orchestrator. So let's look what it looks like. Well, once well, you look at that, I'm getting all this, and then every step of my process is an activity. But then, I can, but then I can start identifying processes in here that are, I, I don't know, that can run config, like in parallel, that I need to do in a week on each and every one of them. I'm not, I'm not done with that yet. I mean, that is just spending. It's just like, like it's my business logic right now. But I might want to remove, I, I don't know, those two goes well together. And then I want to make sure I, I, I want to make sure like this series is done. So so I can just basically say create the fork and then sync and I'm gonna wait wait for those two. This one this one I need all the time. But but here I'm generating the content. But let, but let me see where the content is used. It's only used here. So really I can I can create the task here. I wait wait for all of them and just make sure that. This one I can review the await. I don't need to wait for this until it's done down here. But I don't. But I don't want to start it here because because this I know, I know will take a long time. So I, so I can start right away. Go go through my, my logic and wait until that specific call before doing it. Like I, I can start uh -huh. moving the same stuff around. It becomes this is Lego. It's like okay, so this stuff makes sense more at the end. The end. No, but I want to start earlier. So just let me drop the await and then I'm gonna do task that when. I'll, more below when I'm done. Um, all this, all this stuff is just like, for me, for me, it's like playing blocks. Now. Like, like, okay, so this, I, I, I want to move, move it here. I want to move it here. I want to do this. And if, if every one of one of those steps be, become too too complex, right? Let me just take an example of generate generate on con content. That's a function, right? Call activity. It's an activity. But I can do call you call a sub. I can do call orchestrator. Orchestrator. Go down here. Change, 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 active tree trigger for, for orchestration change trigger. Uh -huh. Change the uh, dribble activity context for I dribble orchestrator context. And I'm, and I'm done. Like, this is not orchestrator. And I, and I can do micro activities. And, and, I, and, I start, and I can start, like, spending a little bit of thing and thing and go through, go through the same success. It's, a, it's the same workflow. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is crazy stuff. I, I, I have the discussion, the functions team right now on the, the uh, refactoring of like actual code. I'm as close as they have to a real customer that they can poke his, his brain all all just like <laughs> I don't know, after Frank Inch or something. But yeah, I'm the it's a lie kind of thing. But I'm actually loving the concept of durable functions in your life. I feel like it's a much more elegant way of dealing with the business logic instead of having to like consider or keep in mind the intricacies of the infrastructure. I mean, this is yep. really what's impressing me the most. We're not, we're not handling this whole plumbing we're doing. Like you don't have to start queues use and then handling handling the queues and what happens if something fails in the queues or if the queue, even if like the storage itself fails because it happens. Uh, we're handling all of this for you, man. You, 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 we don't have anything else to use. It's just write your, your code. We're, we're taking care of this. Like if it's if you know, you know it is a system problem, like like the Azure, Azure storage is failing, we're not, not going to fail your, your function on the, the first try. We're actually going to re retry it and make sure that this thing works. So we know it's, it's always coming from infrastructure itself. It's not coming from you. It's not coming from code. So so all this code that you have to write, to write and the best code is the code you don't have to write, man, because like it's it's, done for you're saving, pretty much. Yeah, you're, you're, you're saving sanity here. But th thank you so much for the very, very elegant answer. Right. <laughs> and anything else? Oh, by the way, don't, don't forget to fill the survey. We, we love service. Oh, I'll fill it out right away. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A anything else? Uh, scenario, scenario. If you're going to go back in the chat, uh, email, email is there. I, I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. 
I try, try to add everyone I can on LinkedIn. At some point, I will reach, reach the limit of people. But um, until then, uh, proving everyone. Uh, um, worst case scenario, uh, send me an email. Um, we can uh, brainstorm on those kind of things. And like there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. Um, obviously, this is just um, this is just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. There's more 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 coming into Azure Function. Is something that I'm, I'm super curious about. I thought I have not really taken the time to play with. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, just I decided to do something here. Uh, people to follow. Jeff Holland, he's on the Azure Functions team. Uh, Chris Gill, Gillum. Chris, where are you? Yeah, it's Chris Gillum. Dribble Function. If you speak Japanese, this guy speaks Japanese as well. Um, for our, um, Kati Shimizu is the one that uh, handles trouble functions, but on the node side, um, and then there she doesn't tweet that much. Otherwise, it's nice to know her name. And, and Maria uh, or, or Mary, Mary, I think it's Mary. Yeah, Mary, Mary H here. Mary, Mary Hoger, uh, I don't know if she's still, still, still on the functions team. She looks like she is. Um, she's also part of the engineering team on the Azure Functions team. And of course, uh, if, if you're into Python, uh, and Tachu, Nichu is now part of, he was part of my team before, but now, now he's not, but he's now uh, one of PM for um, Azure Functions. And, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't have anything else. I think, I, I think I'm out of content here. <laughs> Unless I want to start talking about something else, but uh, I'm pretty much out of content. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you. So I guess there aren't any more questions. Uh, I, I, think we, I, think we, I think we ran almost hours here. here. Yes, yes. I, would say, I would say so. <laughs> so I like very much. Thank you a lot. And hopefully right. we see you again. Yes, see you all soon. Cheers. So if you're interested to give another talk, just write me in LinkedIn or email or whatever you want. Thank you.